Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. We're going to continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power. And last time, we concluded with the assertion, the very powerful assertion made by the former Secretary of the U.S. Navy, Richard Wigginton Thompson, that in order for the papacy to assert its papal system here in America, which it has done, it must first overthrow our Protestant form of government. In other words, it must defeat and destroy popular liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, and it must, in effect, put into action, establish in this country the tenets of Pope Pius IX's encyclical and syllabus of error, where he damned Protestantism and all forms of government uh, of a Protestant nature, and that the people must never govern, but that the Pope must govern the world by his kings. Every nation, every government of the world must be subservient to the papacy because the papacy, by divine right, being the replacement of Christ on earth, has the prerogative of government and that all good government springs from his veins. And therefore, the Protestant government, where the people govern, is apostate and a heresy to be uprooted and extinguished. That's the assertion clearly made by R.W. Thompson in the preceding chapter. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how that is to come about. We're going to speak specifically about the Jesuits in the Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson, Chapter 4. He begins by saying, Pope Gregory XVI, whose pontificate commenced in 1831, was the first pope who seemed encouraged by the idea that the papacy would ultimately establish itself in the United States. Now, this is a somewhat controversial discussion, at least for me. I don't believe it was ever the intention of the papacy to establish the Vatican or the, 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 the so-called chair of Peter, the papacy, in the United States. I don't think it was ever the goal of the papacy to move its seat of authority to the United States. But I do believe that it, was the, that it is even prophesied in the Bible that this country, the United States of America, identified as the second beast in Revelation chapter 13, would certainly conquer the rest of the world for the Pope. And that once that conquest was, was completed, that the papacy would move its seat of authority to Jerusalem. And I believe that is already in the works. As Nicholas and I discussed on one prior uh, program, the papacy has declared that it is going to establish a sovereign enclave, a Vatican-like sovereign enclave within the old city of Jerusalem. Now, I want to ask my listeners a question. If you were Satan, if you had the mind of Satan, understanding that he decreed, and he falsely prophesied in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 15, that he would ex exalt his throne above the stars of God and that he would sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north and that he would be like the Most High. If he were going to create a counterfeit kingdom of Christ on this earth, where would he demand his capital to be? Would, his not, would not his greatest achievement be to establish his phony counterfeit Christian kingdom where Christ walked, where Satan and he met face to face 
in his 40 days of temptation in the desert in Jerusalem. The papacy indicated early in its history, through, through the Crusades, that the papacy covets nothing more than the land of Israel, and more specifically, Jerusalem, and most specifically, that mountain that was originally a threshing floor that separated the wheat from the chaff, where Abraham sought to make sacrifice of his own son, where Jesus walked and taught and preached, where the temple of God dwelt on the top of that mountain, Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. And we've discovered through our studies through the years, thanks to Barry Chamish and others, we've discovered that the papacy now has the deed to Temple Mount in Jerusalem as of, I believe, 1993. The apple of the papacy's eye is and always has been Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. For the greatest deception ever seen upon the earth since the Garden of Eden the papacy is going to proclaim himself the vicar of Christ, the, 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 the Messiah of Israel from God's holy hill in Jerusalem. Now, this author, R.W. Thompson, at least at the time of the writing of this book, believed that the papacy sought to relocate itself to the United States of America. An easy mistake to make not knowing the Scriptures, but we know the Scriptures, and we know history, and the papacy's already proven its covetousness toward Jerusalem. And on that assertion, I'll continue with the reading of the book. It says, his, that is Pope Gregory XVI's chief reliance as the means of realizing this hope, in other words, moving the Vatican to or moving his seat of authority, let's just say, to the United States, was upon the Jesuits, upon whose entire devotion to the principle of absolutism he could confidently rely. He was going to rely on the Jesuits to accomplish his new world order. And that's exactly what the Jesuits do. Now, he said, pre now, let me be specific. The conquering of all governments, the conquering of all people, to lay the whole earth at the feet of the Pope. That is the goal of the Jesuits. That's the very purpose for which they were created. And it says, prepared at all times to labor for the suppression of freedom and trained in a faith which allows to the individual no right of thought or action they were both ready, they being the Jesuits, were both ready and willing agents in the work of assailing our popular institutions, our Protestant institutions. R.W. Thompson has already made the, the, that the, the, uh, the similitude between popular institutions and Protestant in institutions. They're one and the same thing. Popular being governments of, by, and for the people. That's what makes them popular. And Protestant being those rights that are embodied in our Bill of Rights and, finds, and, and is founded as the basis for our form of government here in the United States. Now, it says, with the Jesuits, no form of government has the divine approval unless founded upon the principles of monarchy, okay, the Pope, King of kings and Lord of lords, in their view. And it says, they especially abhor that form of government which confers equality of civil and political rights, which denies the authority of privileged classes, which denies the authority of privileged classes, and forbids the establishment of ecclesiasticism. Forbids the establishment of ecclesiasticism. 
This wonderful society, the Jesuit order, the most wonderful the world has ever known, had been suppressed in 1773 by Pope Clement XIV after a tedious and thorough personal investigation of all the accusations made against it. By this act of condemnation, which is made at the instance of the leading Roman Catholic powers, such a decree of odium was stamped upon its character, that is, the character of the Jesuits, that the people everywhere held it in execration. Now let us understand that the suppression of the Jesuit order came by a papal bull at the demand of the Roman Catholics of Europe. They were sick and tired of the Jesuits raising up overthrows of governments, taking away the rights of the people, promoting a, a promoting uh, uh, hierarchical governments that suppress the people. They were sick and tired of the wars that they fomented to accomplish these things. Their in interference in politics and every other uh, aspect of life. The Roman Catholics were the ones that insisted that the Jesuits be put out of business. And the cry was so loud that the papacy even heard it in Rome. And at its great reluctance, it had to investigate the Jesuits to find out if there are, these accusations were true. And upon discovery of the truth of the intrigues of the Jesuit order, Pope, Pius, or Pope Clement XIV issued the bull of uh, re, uh, Dominus Ac Redemptor and suppressed forever the Jesuit order. They were like, the Jesuits like, were like bull, bull mooses in china shops. They created too much havoc, too much contention, too much hatred, too much bloodshed, too many assassinations, too many poisonings, too many siding with parliaments and then siding with the kings and back and forth. And the governments of the world were in upheaval. And they finally wore out their welcome among the Roman Catholic societies of Europe and the governments sided with the people, and they demanded together that the Pope suppress the Jesuit order. Now it says, its despotic principles and immoral teachings were alike condemned, except by those like Pope Gregory XVI, who saw that in the compactness of its organization and the unity of its purpose, it possessed important elements of strength which it was always willing, and employ, uh, willing to employ in building up the papal structure. The, the papacy recognized the power that the Jesuits had to impose papal supremacy upon the governments. And he didn't want to give up that asset, since world conquest has always been the desire of Satan through his papal throne. But the Jesuits had gone too far. And it says there's no more instructive chapter in history. This is an important uh, sentence in this, in this chapter. Listen, there's no more instructive chapter in history than that which records the events connected with its suppression by the Jesuits. In other words, by the Pope. The suppression of the Jesuits, according to R.W. Thompson, is the most instructive chapter ever written in history. He said the expulsion of the order from the Jesuit order from France, Spain, Portugal, and Sicily, all Roman Catholic governments, the hesitation of Clement, his careful and deliberate investigation of the charges made against it, and how overwhelming proof, and the overwhelming proof which forced him to conclusions he had manifestly endeavored to avoid, all going to show an amount of turpitude which is without parallel elsewhere. So Pope Clement XIV is forced to make a decision, a most, a most 
consequential decision to suppress the Jesuit order. Seeing the value of the Jesuits in promoting the Pope as king of the earth and the problems that they were creating throughout all Europe and the nations. And it says the Pope was reluctant to fix the pontifical censure upon it because it had received the sanction of a number of his predecessors. But as an honest and sincere Christian, says this author, which is not denied except by the Jesuits, he felt himself constrained by a sense of duty to the church and to the world to declare its unworthiness, to declare the unworthiness of the Jesuit order. And in doing so, he satisfied the Roman Catholic governments against which treason had been plotted by the members of the Jesuits and restored quiet for a time to the church. In his pontifical brief, and in this instance he calls it a brief, but in fact it was a, a, a bull, a papal bull, it says, in his pontifical brief, Pope Clement the Fourteenth uh, averred that the Jesuit maxims were scandalous and manifestly contrary to good morals, that the society had bred revolts and intestine troubles in some of the Catholic states, that by means of its practices, complaints and quarrels were multiplied on every side, in some places, dangerous seditions arose, tumults, discords, dissensions, scandals, which weakened or entirely broke the bonds of Christian charity, excited the faithful to all the rage of party hatreds and animosities that the kings most devoted to the church, to wit, those of France, Spain, Portugal, and Sicily, had found themselves reduced to the necessity of expelling and driving the Jesuits from their states, kingdoms, and provinces, these very companions of Jesus, the Jesuit order, which they were compelled to do as a step necessary in order to prevent the Christians from rising one against another and from massacring each other in the very bosom of our common mother, Holy Church, and that, as the Church could never recover a firm and durable peace so long as the said society, the Jesuit order, subsisted, he therefore was constrained to annul and extinguish it forever, to abrogate all the prerogatives which had been granted to them by their general, that is, the black pope, the Jesuit general, and other superiors in virtue of the privileges obtained from the sovereign pontiffs, and to announce to the Christian world that his pontifical act of suppression should forever and for all eternity be valid, permanent, efficacious, and be inviolably observed by all the faithful everywhere. He was going to put a permanent end to the Jesuit order after thoroughly investigating the charges universally leveled at the Jesuits. He did what he did not want to do. He completely demolished the Jesuit order forever and for always. Now, the author at this point includes a note, and he cites the history of the Jesuits by G.B. Nicolini, pages 387 uh, through 406. And by the way, if you can get a copy of that, The History of the Jesuits by G.B. Nicolini, I highly recommend that you do so. I believe it's free online. Just Google the title and read that very important work. We'll get to it eventually here on Inquisition Update. The History of the Jesuits by G.B. Nicolini. Here's what Nicolini had to say about this papal bull suppressing and extinguishing the Jesuit order. He says, this celebrated bull of the Pope is called Dominus Ac Redemptor, and that Clement was exceedingly reluctant to issue it is beyond all question. In a letter written by him in 1768 before he became Pope, and while he was Cardinal Gaganelli, he expressed the opinion that if the Jesuits had not been so quote-unquote obstinate as to refuse any reformation, 
the differences with them might, quote, might have been brought to a happy issue, unquote. And these, that quote is taken from the letters of Pope Clement the sixth, uh, the fourteenth, and it says, to which are affixed anecdotes of his life translated from the French of Lawton Lejeune, volume two and page 201. It says, after he became Pope, and when it became his duty to investigate the complaints against the society, that is, the Jesuit order, he wrote to a Portuguese lord saying, quote, I shall do nothing until I have examined, weighed, and judged according to the laws of justice and truth. May God forbid that any human consideration should influence my decision. I have already sufficiently severe account to render to God without charging my conscience with the addition of a new crime. And it would be, enorm it would be an enormous one to pros uh, proscribe a religious order, speaking of the Jesuits, merely upon rumors and prejudices or even upon suspicion. I shall not forget that in rendering to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, I ought to render to God the things that are God's. That's from the same work, page 224 and 225. So you can see that Pope Clement XIV was extremely loath to suppress this Jesuit order unless sufficient factual information demanded it. And that it did. And that's why he issued the bull. Now, continuing with the text, it says, The Jesuits, by the immoral tendency of their doctrines and the many enormities perpetrated, upon, uh, perpetrated by them against governments, society, and individuals, have become so unpopular throughout Europe that their suppression gave great and almost universal satisfaction. In other words the whole of the Catholic world hooped and hollered when Pope Clement XIV suppressed the Jesuits. It was a relief to the government and the people. It was a big deal, and it was long called for. And when it happened, great jubilation took place. Now, it says it was especially approved by all sincere Christians because they saw that it removed from the church a load which was surely dragging it down. And those who, without belonging to the order, had been educated by it, were con remember that the Jesuits went throughout all Europe and established universities to raise up young men in the tenets of ultramontane Jesuit Catholicism to help overthrow these governments, and that's what they still do today. It says those people who were educated by the Jesuits were constrained to approve the act because it was done by an infallible pope who could not err. So they've sold the idea of... of, of papal infallibility, and, but when it turned against them and the Pope suppressed the Jesuit orders, his infallible rule stood. And those who had even benefited from the Jesuits in their colleges and universities had to accept the suppression of the Jesuits because it was done by a, an inerrant, infallible Pope, a very creation of the Jesuit order. This is called blowback at the CIA, but the Jesuits will not be held down. Now, we're speaking about the suppression of the Jesuits. In 1773, by Pope Clement XIV, some 233-odd years after its foundation by Ignatius Loyola in 1540, the Jesuits are being suppressed and extinct by a papal bull, Dominus Ac Redemptor Noster. And this suppression of the Jesuits, it is said in the book, was especially approved by all sincere Christians. You can take that to mean Catholics and Protestants in this case, because the Protestants were the target of the Jesuit order and all popular forms of government established since 
the Protestant Reformation. It was especially approved by all sincere Christians because they saw in it removed from the church a load which was surely dragging it down. And those who, without belonging to the order, those who had gone to its colleges and universities, had been educated by it, were constrained to approve the act of suppression because it was done by an infallible pope who could not err. This sentiment of approval became stronger in proportion as the practices and policies of the Jesuit order became better known. The public were then enabled to see how entirely at variance the Jesuit practices were with its professions. In other words, their actions did not jibe with their professions. They professed to be a Christian order, but they were tyrants. They were devils. And it says, although one of the articles of their constitution forbade the members of the order from the acceptance of any dignity, and another recommended holy poverty as the bulwark of religion, yet there were among the Jesuits 24 cardinals, 6 electors of the empire, 19 pro, uh, princes, 21 archbishops, and 121 titular bishops, and their aggregate wealth amounted to 40 million pounds sterling, an enormous sum of $200 million. Their general, Lorenzo Ricci, was arrested. That is, the Jesuit general, the black pope at the time, Lorenzo Ricci, was arrested and thrown into prison in the castle of St. Angelo in Rome, charged with an attempt to stir up a revolt against the papal authority with plotting treason against the church and the pope within the consecrated walls of the Vatican. Now, let let me just stop for a moment and make a comment here, and we'll get to this on, on another occasion. But it is said that Lorenzo Ricci, the Jesuit general at the time, was arrested and eventually died at the Vatican. I don't believe that's true. I personally believe that Lorenzo Ricci was spirited out of the Vatican and he was brought to this country. And I know that's going to shock a lot of researchers into this, but I've read a little book entitled Our Flag by Robert Campbell. And we'll get to it here on Inquisition Update, maybe as soon as we finish this book. But at this time, Lorenzo Ricci just disappeared, said to be held in prison at the Vatican. But not much else is said, except in Robert Campbell's book. Now stop and think. If Satan orchestrates the, the conquest of the world, would he intend to leave his greatest power, Lorenzo Ricci, the Jesuit general, whose very purpose is to conquer the world for the Pope, for Satan's man, the Antichrist. And given what we know about Revelation chapter 13 and what role the United States po plays prophetically in conquering the world for the Pope, do you think Satan would allow Lorenzo Ricci to be held in a prison in Satan's church in Rome? <laughs> well, a lot of people, a lot of respected researchers believe that. And I respect those people, too. But I disagree. I humbly disagree. Lorenzo Ricci may have been in prison in St. Angelo's Church in Rome for a spell. But the papacy and the Jesuit order had better plans for Lorenzo Ricci and a new... A new, a new nation from which to lodge its attack and to continue its march toward a new world order right here in the United States of America. 
and it had to do during the time of the very foundation of this country. 1773, the Jesuits were suppressed. Lorenzo Ricci disappears. And then we have what we discovered in the book, The Ark and the Dove by J. Moss Ives. Jesuit priests in the United States of America, during and after their suppression, working without hindrance. Now, if this papal bull, Dominus Acredemptor, had the weight that it should have had, the Jesuits would have been ex exterminated. But that's not what J. Moss Ives reports, that, upon the, that on the Ark and the Dove, the two little ships that left the Isle of Wight in Great Britain, containing a, a, a manifest of Roman Catholics and Protestants together, also included several Jesuit priests. And they came to this country and they founded the Roman Catholic Church in this country. A Roman Catholic Church that pleaded for religious liberty because they, Catholicism was suppressed in Great Britain. They wanted religious liberty for this new country. A country discovered by Christopher Columbus under the auspices of Ferdinand and Isabella, Roman Catholic queen and king, at the behest of the Pope to conquer all lands for the Pope. Do any of us seriously believe that if the Pope said conquer all lands for the Pope, and a Roman Catholic representative, Christopher Columbus, came and so-called discovered this new world, that Satan or the Pope or Ferdinand and Isabella were going to give over this land to Protestantism? Not on your life. And it was the early interference of the Jesuits, even after their suppression in 1773, their influence here in this country that got the Pope the foothold that he now uses during the writing of this book, 17, or 1873, and his uh, Pope, Pope Pius IX writing his encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864, damning the Protestant influence in this country, the war is clearly on. The papacy is going to take control of this country, and I believe it already has. And I believe the planning for America was well established even at the time of the suppression of the Jesuit order in 1773. But nonetheless... The author says their general, the Jesuit general, the black pope, Lorenzo Ricci at the time, was arrested and thrown into prison in the castle of St. Angelo at Rome, charged with an attempt to stir up a revolt against the papal authority, with plotting treason against the Roman Catholic Church and the pope within the sacred walls of the Vatican. Okay. Now, <laughs> judging by how the Vatican treats Protestants, just Bible-believing Protestants, what do, you, what do you think the rightful attitude of the papacy should have been to this Lorenzo Ricci for trying to overthrow the papal throne? It would have been a capital offense. There would have been historical recordings of Lorenzo Ricci's torture and murder. Where are they? Where are they? They don't exist. What did the Vatican really do with Lorenzo Ricci? I've already asserted what I believe, but I ask any honest researcher into this, into this papal suppression of the Jesuits in 1773, judged by the crimes against which the, the, the Jesuits were accused, why was not their leader... killed as a capital offense to the papacy. They killed millions and millions and tens and hundreds of millions of people in all of Europe for far lesser crimes than Ritchie was accused of. Now he continues, he says, 
besides his confession that he had been in secret correspondence with the Russian monarch, the other evidences of his guilt were so convincing that his imprisonment lasted until 1775 when he was relieved from it only by death. Okay, that's one of the most complete histories you'll ever hear of uh, Lorenzo Ricci after the suppression of the Jesuits. That he was kept at the Vatican until he died. And it says the passions of the order were, of course, aroused to exceeding violence, even to such an extent that the Pope himself, although the infallible vicar of Christ, did not escape their vengeance. Now look who's going to die. <laughs> it says they published malicious libels against the Pope, charging that he had been guilty of simony in procuring his election and called him by the, appropri the opprobrious name of Antichrist. Sounds like a smokescreen to me, doesn't it to you? Somebody had to be sacrificed over this. And it was not Lorenzo Ricci. And it says they became so impassioned in their attacks upon him that when his death occurred during the next year, under very suspicious circumstances, they were charged with having procured it by poison. The Jesuit order was accused of poisoning Pope Clement the Fourteenth. Now he, uh, R. W. Thompson, gives us a note at this point. He says. The question whether or not Pope Clement the Fourteenth was poisoned by the Jesuits has given rise to much acrimonious discussion. On one side, it is confidently asserted that he was, while on the other, uh, uh, that he was, while on the other, it is stoutly denied. Great controversy over what what was the fate of Clement the Fourteenth, Was he poisoned by the Jesuits for suppressing them, or was he not? Did he die of natural causes, or was there another murder in the Vatican? And it says, it is said that after his death, quote, his body turned instantly black and appeared in a state of putrefaction, which induced the people present to impute his death to the effects of poison. And it was very generally reported that he had fallen a sacrifice to the resentment of the Jesuits, unquote. This is from the letters of Pope Clement XIV by Lejeune, again on page 45. And it says, Priest says that, the, quote, the scientific men who were called in to embalm his body found the features livid and his lips black, the abdomen inflated, the limbs emaciated, and covered with violet spots. The size of the heart was much diminished, and all the muscles detached and decomposed in the spine. They filled the body with perfumes and aromatic substances, but nothing would dispel the mephitic ex exaltations. In other words, gases escaping from his body. He was in a, a horrible state of decomposition. And it says the entrails burst. Uh, except, excuse me, the entrails burst the vessels in which they were deposited. And when his pontifical robes were taken from his body, a great portion of the skin adhered to them. The hair of his head remained entire upon the velvet pillow upon which he rested, and with the slightest friction, his nails fell off. Again, by Nicolini page 417 and 418. And it says, Cardinal de Bernus, who had been minister of Louis XV of France, was convinced that his death was not from natural causes, and soon after the occurrence wrote thus, quote, When others shall come to know as much as I do from certain documents which the late Pope communicated to me, the suppression of the Jesuits will be deemed the very just and uh, will be deemed very just and very necessary. The circumstances which have preceded, accompanied, and followed the death of the late Pope excite equal horror and compassion. Unquote. And speaking, he is asserting here that the Pope was assassinated. 
And it says, and, and speaking of Pope Pius VI, who was the immediate successor of Pope Clement the uh, Fourteenth, said, quote, The Pope has certain moments of frankness in which his true sentiments show themselves. I shall never forget three or four effusions of his heart which he betrayed with me, uh, which, which he betrayed when with me by which I can judge that he was well aware of the unhappy end of his predecessor and that he was anxious not to run the same risks. In other words, Pope Clement XIV's successor knew that the Jesuits killed him, and he was not going to put himself in that position. He was not going to follow the, the example of Pope Clement XIV. And it says, Gioberte produced the statement of Dr. Bonelli, quote, famous for learning and probity, almost an ocular witness of the facts, uh, uh, almost an ocular witness of the facts, unquote, to the effect that the Pope was poisoned. So here we have another authoritative testimony that the Pope was poisoned. And it says, the Jesuits, in defense of their order, rely upon a statement made some months after the death of the Pope by the apostolic physician and the Pope's ordinary doctor. They declared the charge that the Pope had been poisoned to be false, but offered no proof to sustain the opinion. And the reasons they gave were said to be so strange and suspicious as rather to strengthen than diminish the opinion of those who thought differently. You can just hear the casuistry and sophistry with which the Jesuit order handled the accusation, and people just plain believed they were lying. Typical of the Jesuit order. And here he's going to talk about the historian Cormenon, who has no doubt upon the subject. After having examined all the evidence, he says, quote, The dispatch of the ambassador of Spain relates in his fullest details and examination of the dead body, which was made the day succeeding the death, and adds to the irrefutable proofs of the poisoning of the pontiff and the guilt of the Jesuits. The Jesuits never forget a crime. And they killed Pope Clement XIV for suppressing the Jesuit order. They killed their own pope. Now, mind you, they swear an oath to obey the pope. But they kill him. The Jesuit order is the most obnoxious secret society on the planet. And world conquest is their, their oath-driven goal. World conquest to reduce the earth to the worship and obedience of a single man, a pope of their choosing. And in order to accomplish it, they must exterminate Protestantism. Now, the consequence was that on the account of the extreme contempt in which the Jesuits were held in all the Roman Catholic states, they were compelled to seek refuge elsewhere. Their iniquities were so great and were so well understood that there was not a single Roman Catholic government in Europe that would tolerate them. They found shelter only within the, do the dominions of Frederick the Great of Prussia and Catherine of Russia, the former a Protestant prince and the latter the ecclesiastical head of the Greek church, the, that is, the Russian Orthodox Church. Now, surprisingly, R.W. Thompson doesn't include in this list of Prussia and Russia, the United States of America. But we know there were Jesuits operating without hindrance in this country during the formation and foundation of this country, the formation of its constitution and its seat of government. 
thanks to the book The Ark and the Dove by J. Moss Ives. Amazingly, R.W. Thompson doesn't talk about that. The very country that he has taken as a watchman, as the Secretary of the U.S. Navy, talks about a harbor for the Jesuits against the papal bull in Prussia and Russia and fails to mention this country. And it says there is some some difficulty in the reasons which influenced these monarchs in consenting to receive the refuge uh, the uh, the uh, the fugitives speaking of the Jesuits but they were probably twofold to cultivate the principles of monarchy upon which the Jesuit constitution was based and to reconcile the Roman Catholic citizens of Poland to the partition of that unfortunate country whatever the motive was however they were subsequently expelled also from Russia by an imperial decree of Alexander, wherein he declared, now listen to what Alexander of Russia says about the Jesuit order. Quote, It has been, however, proved that they have not realized the duties imposed upon them by gratitude and that humility commanded by the Christian religion. Instead of remaining peaceable inhabitants of a foreign land, meaning Russia. They have endeavored to disturb the Greek religion, which from time immemorial has been the predominant religion of this country. They began by abusing the confidence they had obtained and have turned away from our religion young men who had been entrusted to them and some weak and ignorant women who have been converted to their own church. In other words, the Jesuits were doing in Russia, even during their suppression, they were doing in Russia what they had done in all of Europe. First and foremost, they were conquering the Greek or the Russian Orthodox Church, which was the product of the first schism in the Roman Catholic Church, they being the equivalent of the second schism of the Roman Catholic Church called the Protestant Reformation. And equally as important as de destroying Protestantism is that rebellious sect of Romanism called the Orthodox Church. In other words, if the Pope is going to rule the whole world, the, Popes have, the, the Protestants have to be destroyed, and so does the Orthodox. They, they being the two greatest oppositions to Romanism since the creation of Romanism. And the Jesuits, after being suppressed in Europe, went and found refuge in Russia and went on the attack against the established religion of Russia, the Orthodox Church. Where's the comment of this author about them coming equally powerfully to this country to suppress Protestantism? It's not here. It's amazing to me. As much as R.W. Thompson reveals in his book, he doesn't include... The Jesuits just uh, planned destruction of Protestantism during this same period of time in the United States of America. He says they began by abusing the confidence they had obtained and have turned away from our religion, that is the Greek Orthodox Church, young men who had been entrusted to them, that is to the Jesuits, and some weak and ignorant women who they have converted to their own church, that is, the Roman Catholic Church. To induce a man to abjure his faith, the faith of his ancestors, to extinguish in him the love of those who profess the same belief, to render him a stranger to his country and to sow tears among, and animosity among families, to tear the son from the father and the daughter from the mother, to stir up division among the children of the same church, is that the voice of the is that the voice of the will of God of God or of his holy son Jesus Christ? This is from Alexander, the king of Russia, his attack against the Jesuit order for doing the same thing in his country that the Jesuits did all over Europe. And I assert the same things that they were doing in this country during the foundation of our government.